few weeks ago, I was cycling along the beach on a one kilometer straight path. I was flying past pedestrians and cars. I was going so fast. I thought, wow, my new exercise regime is really paying off. And then at the end of the road, at the lighthouse of Foch, I turned back and I realized it was not my strong legs that made the difference. It was the wind in my back pushing me forward. On my way home, I struggled up against the wind. It took me much more time and energy to cover the exact same distance. So much for my self-image of a world-class athlete. This too happens in our society, in our schools and at work. Some of us got that wonderful feeling tailwind, getting pushed to high-flying positions, while others struggle up against the wind time and time again. By now, you can probably imagine what I'm talking about. Your gender, age, ethnicity, sexual orientation, class, or physical appearance. Each a little piece of the puzzle, determining how much headwind or tailwind you might experience. Now, we don't see what's right in front of us. When I had that tailwind, the wind in my back, I didn't notice it at all. It was invisible to me. So why do we have such a hard time noticing which way the wind blows? Before we dive into any solutions, let's take a look at how we make sense of the world and how we make decisions. Our brains are bombarded with 11 million bits of information every single second. You're hearing my voice, you're seeing the image, you're maybe smelling your neighbor's perfume, you're touching the not so very comfortable chair and potentially still tasting your last meal. Now, one minute ago, were you aware of how comfortable the chair felt? Probably not, right? If you were consciously aware of absolutely everything all at once, your mind would be completely overwhelmed. So it's our unconscious mind that takes care of most of the processing. In fact, 99.99% .99 of all of the mental processing happens here. It takes in all the signals, it selects some of them, and it sends them through to the conscious mind, at which point you become aware. And the conscious mind is much like the stage, the one I'm on today. You're seeing me here, but almost all of the work already happened backstage. Now, what's really interesting is that our mind makes us think that it's the conscious mind that's in the driver's seat. And it really isn't, and I will show you why. If a team of neuroscientists were to put you in one of those big fancy brain scanners, and they gave you an option A or option B, they can predict your choice up to seven seconds before you are consciously aware of it. In fact, there's this brain activity long before you're even aware. What does this tell us? That we are very good at rationalizing decisions after the fact, instead of making rational decisions. We also use mental shortcuts to help us make decisions. Mental shortcuts are little rules of thumb that help us save the precious cognitive energy that we don't have very much of. And these mental shortcuts are extremely important. We wouldn't be able to survive as a species without it. So think, for example, uh, deciding what you're going to eat for dinner. You might realize it's Sunday night. Sunday night is pizza night. You no longer need to look up 10 different recipes or try to remember what you have in the fridge. Pizza night it is. Now, our ability to make sense of the world with the least amount of, pos of cognitive energy is truly amazing. As I said, we wouldn't be able to do without it. There's just one problem. They're far from perfect. They sometimes let us focus on things that are not important at all, or we don't focus at all on the things that are important. So you end up focusing on things like what someone looks like or how they, what they talk like, which is not actually that important. Now, it's these, cognitive men these mental shortcuts and cognitive tricks happen to every single one of us, right? And when they are influencing our judgments and our decisions systematically, we call this unconscious bias. 
we collectively make thousands of decisions every single day. Our decisions shape our society. But we aren't very good at realizing it when they are hijacking our decisions. So the question is, what would a society look like if we were able to unleash our full human potential where everyone was able to unleash their full human potential, where we could leave the biases and judgments aside? We would be set up for much more creative solutions to the complex problems we're facing, from climate change to obesity, from protecting our freedom to managing our Earth's resources. If you only surrounded yourself with people who already think like you, you would only ever hear perspectives that you already agreed with. People in groups that resemble each other have a much harder time learning and identifying multiple alternatives. And that is bad news for innovation. Diverse groups, on the other hand, with a mix of backgrounds, skills, and experiences, by definition, have a much wider range of perspectives. And hearing someone who thinks differently also makes you think differently. You're likely to work harder to process that information and come to more nuanced decisions as a result. And diverse groups also have this ability to you know, work together and come get closer across these differences and learn from each other. And this really is the secret sauce to innovation. Now, I think that businesses and institutions are a great place to start creating the change and eliminating some of these biases. First of all, businesses impact every single one of us. The, the things they invest in, the products they build, the people they serve and the people they employ. Second, we each spend half of our waking hours at work. And we make more biased decisions in situations where we're either under pressure or stressed, which is a feature of our modern work lives. And third, just take a moment to think about your family and your closest friends. Chances are that they grew up or were born in the same country or even the same city and that you share the same ethnic background and religion. And now think about your colleagues, or even your patients or your customers. It's quite possible that they grew up in different cultures, that they have completely different interests and, 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 and hobbies. Now, it would be so beautiful if we got to that deeper and nuanced understanding of each other, because that is really what breaks stereotypes and builds true inclusion. So, how can we get rid of this strong impact of the wind with the headwind or the tailwind in the first place. First, we can try to teach the people with the wind in their back to be a little bit more aware of it. This is what happens when we offer unconscious bias training, which is what a lot of companies do and actually spend up to $8 billion a year on these kind of trainings. The problem is, the idea is actually that by just being aware of your unconscious biases, you would change your behavior. Now, the problem is that these trainings are often not successful. They haven't been proven to work. In the best case scenario, people might change their attitudes towards women or ethnic minorities or other social groups. But most of the time, these attitudes bounce back to square one within 72 hours. And in the worst case scenario, these trainings actually create backlash, resulting in fewer women and ethnic minorities making it to manager or leadership level. These trainings don't change behavior. What you can also try to do is teach the people who are facing the headwind to cycle harder, right? to lean in. And this is what happens when companies only offer salary negotiation training, which happens quite often, or leadership training, or networking events. It's just simply not enough. If you're trying to tell someone you've got to be different, but not to change the environment around them, you're not going to be very successful. So today, I would like to share with you a third option, which is to design our environment. We need to put up a beautiful, big, sturdy windscreen, blocking the wind from having such a strong impact in the first place. By focusing on this solution, we acknowledge that we humans are not perfectly rational. 
And that knowledge alone is not enough. We need to focus on our environment to help us make better decisions, better and fair decisions. So let me share some examples with you. Imagine that you're constructing a team. You want to find the best person for the job, right? Turns out that the traditional job interview is not the best way to find out. First of all, we humans, all of us, intuitively prefer people who are similar to us. We call this similarity bias. So you end up choosing the candidate that also loves FC Porto or rock climbing, or incidentally went to the same university. And second, we also know that job interviews are a much better measure of how confident someone is than how skilled they actually are at the job. So instead of asking the question, how would you go about writing a memo about international expansion, instead you should put together a one-hour task in which you ask them to actually write that memo. That small change can create a huge impact. You can take their work sample, take off their name, and then you can focus on the quality of the output without being limited by your early impression of the candidate. So let me tell you a little story to, to show how it works. In the 1970s, only 5% of all orchestra musicians were women. They realized they had a diversity problem, as they called it, and they made one small tweak to the hiring process. They, instead of letting the musician come up on stage, sit down with their instrument and start playing, they put up a screen hiding the musician from view so that the orchestra director and the panel of judges could focus squarely on the quality of the music and be liberated from their assumptions and stereotypes of what an ideal musician would look like. And this small tweak had a huge impact. Nowadays, almost 40% of all orchestra musicians are women. Let's also take a look at promotions. We've already talked about it. Now, uh, for every 100 men that get promoted to manager for the first time, only 86 women are. And this gap becomes bigger at the top. For only one in five executives are women. And there are a lot of complicated explanations for the gap between men and women at leadership level. But there's one that actually might surprise you, which is that in most companies to get recognized for a potential promotion or for a salary raise, you have to put yourself forward. You have to put up your hand. What if we rethink this process? What if instead we automatically considered everyone, every top performer for that promotion unless they actively opt out? And this is what was tested in an experiment. They made a single, simple tweak. So you have raise your hand if you want it, or only raise your hand if you don't want it. And this small tweak eliminated the gender bias. All of a sudden, men and women were equally likely to compete. And this same process, this same pattern, applies not only to gender. It's not only a competition difference between men and women. We also know that ethnic minorities are less likely to apply for promotions. So, conclusion is, that if you want everyone to have a fair chance at promotions and at pay raises, just ditch this promotion form and actively consider everyone. But there's more we can do with behavioral science. We can also nudge leaders and managers to embed inclusive behaviors in their day-to-day. -day. It's really important to put in place processes that make it easy for everyone to be fair, but we, we can't rely on process alone. We also have to help people embed inclusive behaviors. So that's what we've been doing at FairSQ. We've built a Slack bot in which we're sending one weekly message to leaders and managers, reminding them about an important topic. Things like how to talk about mental health at work, or how to write fair performance reviews, or in this case, how to lead team meetings in which everyone gets a chance to speak up including more junior or introverted colleagues. Now, it's early days. We don't have experimental results just yet, but the managers we spoke to 
said that they were more aware and that they had more supportive conversations with their team as a result. And over the coming months, we're going to test, learn, and adapt. Now, today, I wanted to share two ideas with you. First, we can change our processes to help people cut through, to, cut through the noise and the bias and make better and fairer decisions. And second, diverse and inclusive teams have brighter futures. We know, yes, humans are complex, so let's test all of these different ideas, let's try them out in different contexts, and let's test, learn, and adapt. I hope that you are feeling hopeful today that we can make change happen together. And perhaps you're going to be that little bit more aware of the wind in your back, but by now you also know that awareness alone is not enough. We need to focus on changing our environments, not just our minds. So next time you cycle along the beach or find yourself making any decisions at work, bring your study windscreen with you. I will do the same.